Welcome one, welcome all to the Politics of Cinema. On this show, we believe that films are never neutral. There's a political as well as an artistic message captured in every film, and we're on the lookout for all of it. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Isaac Miller, and we are celebrating May Day all month with a look at workers' films. On this episode, we are looking at Michael Schultz's Car Wash, 1976, and Herbert J. Biberman's Salt of the Earth, 1954. But also, Isaac, on each episode, we're checking in with our continuing uh, watch challenge this month, portrayals of labor uh, and film from different decades. I have to say, I um, already, I didn't want to say I already screwed this up, but I got i got distracted. Okay. Watch Car Wash, 76, loved it. We'll get to that in a second. But then also, I was like, wait a minute, I wonder if there's other, because my focus was like the service industry. I wanted to see how the service industry has been portrayed um, as a job in films, which is one of the reasons I picked car wash. And I was like, wait, I wonder if there's other stuff from the seventies I could watch. Like maybe I'll just watch a bunch from the same few years and see how the different, see how it's portrayed differently. Mm. So that was a failure. Cause I tried the movie record city from 1978, which is billed as a lighthearted comedy about um, employees at a record store. And I was like, Oh, perfect. I would have preferred to, you know, like a, I don't know, movie theater or something, I guess, but I'll give this one a shot. Oh my God, it's terrible. It's so bad. Here's how bad it is. Gallagher is in it. What? Yeah. What? Playing himself. He's playing himself. But uh oh it's it's I'm not sure that helps. No, no. <laughs> it it doesn't. But um yeah, so that experiment went the wrong direction. So like I watched that. It is all about employees there, but it's 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 done on like it's a sitcom level. Like mm. it's 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 not really a movie. It's just like there, there's just the, the manager is just a serial like sexual assaulter of all the female employees, but it's kind of played for laughs and he kind of gets his come up and, and there's a local DJ that comes. that's going to host like a remote uh, concert or talent show, I should say, in front of the record store. Like there's potential there. And I just got angrier and angrier as it went on because it just was losing all of the potential uh, to it. More on that at the end of the show, but. That that was one of the, the the lanes I veered into. I was like, oh, let's let's look at Surface Industry in the seventies. That may be an option, and there may be other good films out there. I, I'm I'm uh, not going to be sticking around uh, in the seventies to figure that out. But I also wanted something that wasn't the eighties, so that also fit my bill. Um, and it was streaming, so I could just click on it. I was like, oh, let's give it a shot. And- so I have to admit, I mean, what were we doing for this challenge? We were doing the eighties, seventies, and sixties. Well, no, it was whatever you wanted to, but like portrayals of labor from different decades. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I thought I might have put in that rule, which of course would be me hoisting myself on my own petard here, because the movie I watched was from the 30s. Oh, what did you watch? I watched Riff Raff. Not the Ken Loach comedy? No, with uh, Gene Harlow and Spencer Tracy by... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, by uh, J. Walter Rubin with, from 1936. Here's the reality. It's... um. It's, you know, it's it's a love story, and it is interesting because it actually sort of relates to Salt of the Earth in the sense of, like, uh, you know, stubborn macho men causing problems. Um, <laughs> but it's also interesting because it's this New Deal period where labor unions are bad, but communists are – well, no, labor unions are good. I'm sorry. Labor unions are good and communists are bad. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So it's like the communists is sort of the corruptors and making you do stupid things because they're just, you know, they just want to, you know, use you, but it's bad for, you know, it's bad union organizing and it's a bad strategy, which is kind of the opposite of reality of the thirties where like union or the best union organizers were usually the communist party. Like it's just not, it's just not accurate at all, but it's an interesting point of reflection where like, at least in the film, I mean, we, we cannot look at this film as the avatar of uh, 1930s attitudes, let alone, I don't know, the establishment. That's not really how film works. But the fact that it was made and it was clearly anti-communist and pro-union is an interesting reflection of the 30s. Well, so yeah, also at that time period, too, is really fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it's very clearly, you know, it, it fits. I'm going to really not have trouble covering the 40s because a large portion of my minor uh, li- my minor movie list, uh, I mean, movies about minors, is they're like all 40s movies. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that one. Yeah. 
No, I, I, I was kind of skipping around, with, not skipping around. I was kind of alternating decades with mine. So like, you know, car wash was one of my picks at the 70s. I'm jumping to the 90s uh, with my next one just to, because I wanted to build up to um, a contemporary one. Oh, I'm super excited for uh, whatever your, um, for whatever your uh, uh, um, 90s one is going to be. Well, pump the brakes on that excitement. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. But first we have to stop off with uh, car wash. 1976, where we get to hang out with the crew at the Deluxe Car Wash over roughly, well, it's like one shift. I think it's like an eight to 10 hour period there where we get to hang out with Lonnie and Abdullah and Lindy and Hippo and everybody that works in and around the car wash. They still do it by hand at Mr. B's. Morning, Mr. B. Morning, Snapper. Only determination. Got the big three. Dedication. That a tough crew of men can get the job done. Stand and deliver, honey. They've got a sharp boss who always has control of the situation. They've got teamwork. Hi, I'm Coy. Ho! And I'm Lloyd. And we're the futuristic. And most of all, they've got the will to work. I don't want you to leave here without... Realizing what I can do for your car. Like what? Take over the payments for me? <laughs> this is the wet and wild world of the car wash. A business a man can be proud of. I want to work with the men, Dad. Where the only rule is, do it with style. It's hard work, because sooner or later, everyone comes through here. Yeah, did you happen to see a big, tall, black, blonde chick? Big, big, black, blonde Red chick? boots. Listen, I'd like to talk to someone and get some information about a social disease. Hey, brothers, I'm here to unite with you. Hey, baby, how you doing? Oh, hey, how Good, I'm glad to hear that. Between the washing and the cleaning, there's always room for dreaming that the next car through might be the answer to your prayers. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Well, praise this car, honey. Thank you, miss. <laughs> but one thing is certain. When it comes to serving the public, these men will stop at nothing. Uh, directed by Michael Schultz. And to my surprise, uh, as we were researching the, the films we're doing this particular month, written by Joel Schumacher. I hate to, like, stop the conversation about Car Wash with, like, uh, the white guy who wrote it. But that took me aback when I was like, wait, that Joel Schumacher? Well, especially when you watch this movie, you know, it's, it's directed by a black director. It's got a almost exclusively... The cast is almost exclusively people of color, except for one of the workers and the owners and George Carlin's kind of befuddled racist, like liberal <laughs> racist around, cabbie. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not racist, but cabbie. Like right. that's it, right? And then some of the customers, but like everybody else is like black. I think there's somebody who's Puerto Rican and one who's uh, indigenous. That's it. Right. 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 Uh, you know, no, it just, it just, uh, it took me aback. Um, and then of course I was like, wait a minute, if I misjudged Joel Schumacher, uh, throughout his career and, um, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit, but, um, you know, I that's mean, fine. Mid seventies Schumacher. Yeah. Pretty clearly. Cause I gotta say right off the bat, I didn't know this movie before you suggested it and it's a masterpiece. It's incredible. It's, you know, the 70s is full of a number of very good hangout movies. And, you know, I love American Graffiti and so forth, but this is better. Yeah. It's the analysis of sort of class and race and what it's like to work at a job in which you're dealing with like customers all day and how you keep yourself going through that mm -hmm. is just pitch perfect. Here's the funny thing. You don't think of a comedy about like, a car wash in which people are constantly listening to music and dancing while they do it as a movie that f is filled with menace and danger. But the truth of it is you feel for me, at least you feel it throughout because you know, you know, you have, you have a queer, I don't know if, I don't know if uh Lily is it. Yeah. I don't know. Lindy. L Lindy. Sorry. I, I don't know if she's, trans or how she would like today how she would exactly represent herself but you know you have this queer i think probably trans character you have you know primarily black men one of whom is like a family man who's just got who's out of prison one of whom is a, a is a black militant and you know one of them does get arrested throughout and people are making jokes but it's not actually fun. i mean it's that's the thing is like underneath 
the humor and everything is this level of melancholy and the sense of that there is like a layer of like the vulnerability of poor of poor people of color on top of like this incredibly energetic and fun film. I don't know. Yeah, no, actually, you you, you threw out like a, a bunch of points I had written down in my notes here. Um, I do want to. Well, let, let's let's go with the interactions with the customers first. Yeah, because uh, you you were kind of pointing out in a different way than I was reading the movie initially. Because you do like you, it's it's a service industry job which we both have. I feel like I've almost exclusively had actually at this point in my in my, in my life. Uh, granted, I'm in a library situation now, so it's a little bit different dynamic because only certain people, generally speaking, go into uh, a library, a public library, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But uh, the clear backbone of the plot, as you could call it, that to this movie is dealing with the customers. Yep, you've got. And it's it's it shouldn't work. It shouldn't work. This movie shouldn't work either because one of them is like some uppity uh, white lady from Beverly Hills who has a son who's like ready to puke or pukes a few times. You've got a guy who's like in a full body cast who's left in the cars goes to the car wash. And then you have a guy who they think is a mad bomber uh, coming through with a jar of piss. <laughs> like yep, it it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. What is is the line basically white people are crazy or something like that? It's like, mm, you, you know, yeah, yeah. In, in this plot, for sure, uh, for sure. But yeah, you said like you were you were describing to me before we were recording, like the, the cross section of people that they're dealing with as far as the general public goes versus like the economics of the customers versus the 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 economic life of the people that are actually working at the car wash. Yeah, like there you've got, you know, some of them are, have got side gigs is like and you know, trying to become in break into the, you know, like the entertainment industry, you got your ex con where this is probably the best he's going to get. And he's just trying to move up played. I mean, we, we, we should get, you know, honestly, we should take a moment to go through the cast after we're saying this point, like, cause this cast is stacked and you know, you've got, you've got like a lot of people who are sort of vulnerable. I mean, when you sort of think about, um, or not even just vulnerable, but like, it's like it is like the characters that you get at like a job like you know like a job like this in a way right like oh I don't know there's so many it's oh, just a, I'm I'm sort of getting off something it's just a movie full of vignettes and strands and like arcs for each character just little arcs and they they weave together so perfectly in mood it's just and it's oh wow well you mentioned being a hangout movie which was like one of the first things I thought of. Um while watching this movie as well because you, you get the vibe of just you're hanging out with them very very you get it immediately and it's it's a type of movie that i've been thinking a lot about the last few years just because like that that word was thrown around a lot with um once upon a time in hollywood and then i was like oh i i guess that is sort of like a thing i've noticed in movies that i like you know like a days to confused or you know those type of movies and this is entirely that kind of movie but it's interesting it's extra inter interesting to me because this is a. Uh, it's 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 a total hangout movie, but it's hanging out with characters in their work life, yep. which is really interesting to me because so I, you and I uh, shared a bit of work life at an art house theater for uh, for a year or two. And I feel like that's a really good comparison. I've also uh, like I worked at pizza places um, over the years when I was in college and whatnot. And there's certain environments that attract certain types of people. And I would say like the art house theater we, we, we were both shared for a little bit is one of those. And as bad as it could get with a guest or with a patron or with a customer coming in, it was always, to me, felt a little bit better because I was around people I cared about and that I, I liked working with. And right. that takes a little bit of like the, 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 the work burden off your shoulders. And I, this movie really captured that for me because you could see there was like, there really was a sense of camaraderie and not that not everybody's necessarily best friends, but like even when people were picking on each other, it wasn't malicious. Right. Like at one point, somebody like hollows out somebody's burrito and shoves in a bunch of peppers. So like, ah, I got you a bunch of hot food in your mouth, you know, and they burn their mouth or whatever. Well, like and that, it's was, not, that was countering for another prank. Right. But it's not right. malicious. They'll be friends at the end of the day. Yeah. 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 And they uh, yeah. And they still they're friends like immediately afterwards, too. They're like, oh, God, you got me or whatever. And so it's it's there's no maliciousness to it. But that captures and also it really it contrasted with um to me very much with the soul of the earth, the other movie we're going to talk about here in a minute where like, that's a very different perspective of work. Like that's right. work, but keeping it on car wash though. Like it, it, it was interesting that it was dealing with work in a very different way where 
there was no talk of like unionizing at the car wash. The plot of this movie isn't aspirational overall to like get somewhere else. It's more just like, here's what we're doing right now. Here's the gig. And there's so much fun, I guess, in and around it because it feels like there's this kind of uh kind of family environment. It's not family, like maybe like a friend's environment that is built up because of the nature of they just work at their neighborhood car wash. I don't know. Like it doesn't have like a burden of like, there's not a burden of work going on in this movie. I, so I think there's, I think there's a little more of an edge here. So like we said, there's at least one character who, you know, like his girlfriend expects him to go somewhere else. They are disputing. They nearly break up over this. You have the great Ivan Dixon's character. Who's an ex con with, kids and this is probably they don't say it but like the parole officer shows up and he's like do you oh, yeah, yeah. get out of here you're gonna get me fired and he's trying you know he's part of it is he's the adult there right like these are right. all really young people. yeah well but he's you know and you can see it right like he's he's the second he's not actually the, he's the second oldest person working there but he's he's you know he is sort of like the adult like he is trying to keep things in line or like a little bit, right? And then seriously by the end, but he also has been trying to suggest to the owner of the place improvements so that he can get a pay rise because he has kids. And, you know, you have the romantic problems or whatever, but like those romantic problems feel really real. You feel the edge of both their camaraderie, but also the racial and class differences because the owners, the owner who is sort of, quite a character in and of himself son is there i guess back from college who is like a college maoist like the most clueless yeah, college right. maoist possible he's just standing you know he's just wandering around i want to be a worker let me uh work you know let me work with you or you know just getting in the way or trying to read to them from the little red book and they're just sort of they're totally disrespectful it doesn't matter you know they just sort of prank him because you can you know he's not and yet at the end, you know, at the end, they're like kind of they acknowledge him a little bit, like a little bit. Yeah. But like he's overtly a goopball. He has a Mao T-shirt on. Yes. He's a total he's a cartoon character. Yeah. Yeah. But part of what it is, is like you have that what you get that feeling of is they have to do this to get through the day. You have to sing and you have to you have to joke and you have to you're ingrained in people's lives because you see each other all day and, you know, you have to do it. And I think that's a very special feeling, right? Uh, I, I guess I'm saying that there's more, I think there's more of an an edge. I think it does feel like work, but they've covered that. They What they've done is they've successfully shown what you do to get through that work, what how you make that work feel less like work. Right, right, right. I guess that's, that's, that's where I was going for. Cause it's, it's, you're, you're not, one of the narrative choices you could have done with this movie was like, have like the new person starting at the car wash and then they're introduced to all the, and they don't do that. No, it just jumps right in. There's already a work dynamic. There's already a friend dynamic. There's already a camaraderie dynamic here. Um, it really reminded me of the work scenes in Blind Spotting from 20, 2018, mm. where when they're working at Commander Moving together, there's camaraderie in the the locker room, and they're out working together. And you have two friends. They're like they're at work, but they're also friends. Like they're it, right. it makes the work go a little bit a little bit easier. It makes it go down a little bit easier, I guess. I was just thinking about. I mean, it, and it's also like you have sort of the randos around the, around the car wash and yeah. the ones who aren't customers. So there's the kid on the skateboard who just hangs around there and just what he does. Right. And he's annoying. Yeah. He's annoying. He's just disruptive. And they just as a quick aside in record city, the movie that I'm saying, don't watch that I watched. Um, there's also uh, two kids on skateboards that fuck with the owner of the record store. And I was like, what was it? We're skateboarding kids, like the biggest pest in the world in the late seventies. What's going on here? They were, they were, they were, you know, it was a plague. Well, as a former skater, I was just like, we're, they're not, we're not bothering anybody. We're just skating. Who gives a shit? I, well, that's what you thought. I'm kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but part of it, you know, there's that scene. I, I think, you know, it just this shows us so well, or they show how much he matters and also how they work as a group, like the sense of community, but it's a work community. It's a very specific kind of community. And when, when it looks like he gets hit by a car and he's just, he's actually just screwing with them. He's what a little brat, but like they all rush out, right? Like they literally yeah. just part of it is they do it in a scene right where one of the people had just said, like, go away, like indicating they don't care. And then immediately showing how much they do. I just, I feel like that's just perfectly executed. Yeah. 
Oh, well, because I, I feel like everybody they don't make a big deal of it in the movie, but I feel like every people aren't like driving in from long distances to come work at the car wash. They're like they're working at their neighborhood car wash. Right. Maybe taking a bus in on occasion, but like this is like this is their neighborhood and the the where this is where they live. Right. And it's sort of the janky car wash because sure he says that doing it by hand is um is how they stay the the the, uh, the owner says that's why they're classy, but like well, it's probably he doesn't want to spend the money. He's being cheap about it. Like, well, why would I pay for these machines to go in when yeah. uh, y'all are already right here? No, every, yeah, every character gets an arc. Um, do we want to talk about queer representation? I don't know if you wanted to jump to that, but yeah, that's fine. I think you already you kind of mentioned it earlier, and we were um, you know immediately immediately gushing uh, about the film. But you have uh, Lindy, the character played by Antonio Fergus in this movie, and. To be perfectly honest, I I knew this character was in this film because I've read uh, Vita Russo's Solid Closet book and I've seen the documentary a few times. And this is like a famous bit of uh, early representation. But as soon as Lindy popped up on screen and I knew this movie from 1976, I was like, oh, God, where is this going to go? Like I was braced for Were you were you feeling that, too? Yeah. Oh, I thought, you know, you're either going to have tragedy. I wasn't worried about that, but I was going to expect a lot of homophobic stuff from coworkers. Right, right. Just all the cliches. And you don't, you no, don't get it. None. It was refreshing. In fact, there's, uh, again, since it was, this is uh, written by Joel Schumacher, at one point, and I guess this would be a good transition to uh, after we talk about uh, the Lindy character, talk about Bill Duke's performance in this movie as uh, Dwayne. Mm-hmm. They have a little confrontation. I'm so tired of you running off at your mouth that's getting me down, honey. Why don't you just leave and be an assassin? Or is the only thing you're good at shooting off is your big mouth? Would you please get out of my face, you sorry-looking faggot? Who are you calling sorry-looking? <laughs> Can't you all see that she ain't funny? She's just another poor example of how the system has of destroying our men. Honey, I am more man than you'll ever be, and more woman than you'll ever get. Joel Schumacher would go on to use that exact same line when he wrote and directed Flawless with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Robert De Niro. Far inferior film, but not terrible film. But like it became its own, it became a pretty iconic line. And also it's a great comeback in that scene. It's incredible line. Think about, but think about the context of that. Think about that. That's like an empowering line today, yeah. right? And part of it is is that Lindy is more in the in crowd than Duke's character. Duke's character is a surly sort of black nationalist. He's young, he's very young, and he's he's frustrated with where he is. And he's frustrated with the world as as, he is, as it is, and he's late a lot, and he's getting in trouble. And they have this confrontation, I think partially because of, you know, his underlying sort of nationalist politics are pretty conservative. He's the only one. Everyone else refers to her as she and is perfectly respectable. Yeah. Uh, respectful beyond, like, the regular joking, but none of it's about that, right? Everybody knows who she is and what, you know, it's it's – and they even make joke about, like – Remember, you know, people hooking up there. I think there's clues that a lot more people are there are queer, frankly. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think so. I, you know, it's not totally clear, but like you, just from the dialogue, like it's just, it's just, it's just normal. And I think part of it is that's a slice of life. This is a demographic. Like you have a lot of movies with black characters in the 70s, but I don't think you, or characters of color in general, but I don't think you get a cross section that feels like this is probably what life was actually like. Um, I can't think of another movie like this. No, it feels very unique that way. I think. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's the best line. It's devastating. You can't come back from that. Well, and he doesn't. He doesn't either. Yeah. And I should have should have said I, I credit him as Dwayne, but he makes a very specific point in the movie. He is uh, identifies as a black Muslim revolutionary who goes by Abdullah now, not Dwayne. So right. Apologies to that character, but you're right. It, it's it's a deeply uh, conservative place he's coming from because he, and he he, but he's not like a dismissible character. Like he is a fu- he feels he's a fully fledged character in his own right because like his his uh 
when he's when he's trying to take down Lindy at that scene, he talks about how, you know, he's been ama- Lindy's been emasculated by the white man. And that's what they, you know, want you to do. By, and like and Lindy just she, she has that line ready to go. Like there's no like, <laughs> there's no hesitation, no nothing like that is a confident person who's comfortable with their surroundings. And also, I think, knows that they're there with like their um, co-workers, but also friends. And, you know, they've got her back. Right. Yeah, it's it's this is well that yeah that she's she's got this under completely unlocked and part of it is, I mean but then there's you know part of it is you see sort of the casual materialism and so forth so uh, Richard Pryor is in this movie in a pretty amazing scene in which he is he must be a televangelist like yeah it actually he's almost like a, he's like a prosperity doctrine kind of version of a televangelist yeah i didn't really even know they had that sort of thing in the 70s like quite like that in the 70s is totally prosperity doctrine like well, i i think it's it's heightened for comic effect i don't think right. it was quite i mean it, it feels to me like satire and actually it's, a, it's another scene where a, 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 everyone else just plays along they're really excited that they're there that you know that prior's character's there they're really you know impressed and they're Totally on board. I mean, you, you don't even feel like these are necessarily people who are religious, but this is part of the show, right? Like this is part of the entertainment is going along with this and like, hey, maybe I'll make some money out of this. It's a full musical number. It's a right. It's a full musical number. He's got the Pointer Sisters with him and they're, uh, yeah, it's a full musical number. They're singing a song about him and how awesome he is. Daddy Rich, Daddy Rich. And Rich, when when Abdullah, who in this case, I, I'd be a little more on his side, tries to take this guy down as a charlatan, which is, True. Accurate. Which is hundred percent accurate, but like nobody backs him up then either. Yeah. And it's really hard to beat the pointer sisters. <laughs> like, no, it's, it's true. Well, cause also this is what you're talking about, like all the little tiny arcs to the different characters. So um, for Abdullah, Bill Duke's character, his arc is like one of isolation and then desperation. So he's isolated when he is, in my opinion, also correctly calling out daddy rich, the Richard Pryor televangelist. Like he's overtly, money hungry and talking about it and he's but everybody's going along with him because he's a local celebrity and that's you know like everybody's a little starstruck by him and then the scene with Lindy, and then uh abdullah is further isolated and then you end up getting to a scene where he comes back with a gun to rob the place well and this is after he's fired because the thing is he so part of it is the boss at this place who is sleeping with the uh inside attendant and is kind of a you know, kind of in a lot of ways, pretty weak willed in a lot of ways, like he, the employees, you know, he doesn't have a lot of control over the place, right? No, um, no, no, no. He's owner and name only. I mean, he owner and name only, except that he can fire you. Right. And yeah, and it is, it doesn't, I mean, we're sort of talking about the experience of working at the movie theater. You know, when you're comfortable at a small business, you can sometimes, depending on the boss, you can push things a lot. Oh yeah. Um, and but, you know, he fires him because he's not showing up to work, which, you know, I don't really believe in work or capitalism or whatever. But it is like you are going to get fired if you don't show up to work enough or you're, if you're late too much. It's gonna late, yeah. And Ivan Dixon's character, who I think is, you know, when we haven't talked about quite a lot, but he is an ex, you know, sort of a middle aged ex con, probably had been political, has a real connection with Abdullah. His kids, his kids come by during it. Right. Like everybody knows those kids. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And he's trying to make something of himself and you really, which is in some ways it's a cliche character, except that he's not at all. Right. Like he sells it though. It yeah, is, no, not at all. Yeah. It's perfectly sold. And you know, I think I just think about him in nothing but a man. And to me, it really, I don't know, just I, whenever I see him in a movie, it just hits home. And you know, so when, when Abdullah, uh, Abdullah, he's the only one there, right? He's counting up the cash register. He's closing up. And Abdullah mm-hmm. comes in, uh, comes in with a gun, and I'll tell you, this is what I mean about like the sense of danger in this movie. I did not know if Ivan Di- I- Ivan Dixon's character was going to get shot or not. I really did not. Right. I mean, I don't know if you did. You, did you actually did you feel it, that the tension there? I don't know. I did. I did. I maybe not as quite as strong as you did because I was like, well, you know, this is officially a comedy, and the tone of the movie up to that point was like, this is a comedy. But no, as soon as he was there with the gun and there's a sense of um, uh, it brings a sense of chaos to it or like unexpected. You're like, oh, I, I don't know where this is going. And also, like we said, he's been so completely isolated at that point. One with like the Richard Pryor scene, then with Lindy and then getting losing his job. Or was like, 
I guess you could have a dramatic scene here and still end on a comedic note. I don't know, but I'm glad they didn't because it and between him and um, the scene with him and Ivan Dixon, like it's really touching and the tonal shift that the movie is able to balance between like, it sells this really emotional scene where Dixon kind of like as Lonnie, he talks him down and he's, you know, not going to like turn him over to the cops because we've already seen what, you know, ex con Lonnie, like what his idea of, of the cops and parole officers in the system is he's, going to deal with this and then you know luckily like again no shots are fired uh, disarms the guy and he's not going to you know immediately call the cops or call 911 or anything like that he's like talking to the guy and he's trying to talk him down he's like man you're going through some stuff like i'm here for you i got gotcha. you it's more like a, a mentor mentee almost relationship which is weird because it's not how that scene starts at all like it starts with like legit danger it does well but part of, i think that's their relationship a little bit throughout the whole movie it is it degree. is but yeah no you see him really you see that mentor well, you, part of it, what you know, he says is uh, Lonnie, or I've been calling him Ivan Dixon, but like Lonnie does not care about the money. He doesn't right. care about following the law per se. He's trying to save this kid, like this young man. Like he's right. trying to save him. And it's like this, you know, this will destroy your life. It is not worth it. It's not even, he says it, it's not even that much money. Right, right. And there's something, just the texture, and like I think those are perfect words. Like that perfectly captures that moment of like, of the position of this person who, you know, of of of, of Lonnie, who is someone who has lived, who's lived life and is trying to carve something out, and knows knows what he can lose. I don't know. It's just, oh, it's so good. Well, no, I think because they both connect, and I think that's why he's trying to kind of mentor. Um... Abdullah bit throughout the whole movie actually is because he rec- they, they, they both recognize there's like a there's a sense of pride there and they want to have like you know pride in their work or pride in their life or have some meaning there but they're at a job that's just like basically hopefully maybe not even quite paying the bills and then at the end of the day because at the end of that scene you know it's just going to be like all right well it's time to go home and we'll do it tomorrow I guess again because that's this is what we're doing and I no, it, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, like it is a very like. I'm trying not to use the word melancholy, uh, but that's kind of that is it is a kind of a melancholy ending to a movie that's mostly predominantly comedy up to that point. But it works. It works. Like it, it, it. None, the the notes, the tone of this movie, like it never rang false to me the whole way through. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, part of the brilliance is that perfect tonal control and yeah. tonal control that could spiral out of control really easily. I like, probably should have. I mean, based on, I mean, the way that we're like haphazardly describing this, it sounds probably sounds like a mess if you haven't seen it. Yeah. And it's not at all. Well, you know, it really does help to be like 50 to 60 percent musical. You know, I, I wrote that in my notes. I don't think this is necessarily open for debate here because like I, I have a very liberal definition of what musicals are. But I, like my fourth bullet point was like, oh, my God, I hope this is a musical. And then like my ninth, tenth bullet point is, yeah, this is a musical. <laughs> The DJ on the radio is basically the narrator to this movie, which is awesome. Actually, during the credit, like the end credits, isn't the DJ actually the narrator? Yeah. And in the opening, too, there's even a line in the opening uh, where it's like the DJ on the radio. that's like, your radio is not even really on. <laughs> like, it even <laughs> had us an audience member. You're like, oh, my God, I love this movie so much. <laughs> it's real. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 pretty it's pretty spectacular. Um, and it has that whole and I think having like the radio soundtrack also gives it that hangout vibe uh, to me because it, it's almost just like the radio is just playing the whole time and you just happen to be watching everybody at work right now. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, I could just I can just go on and rave scene by scene, I guess. But uh, any other notes on Car Wash, Isaac, before we uh, head on to the next film? Um, I think that this is a. I think one of the things I love about this movie, I love movies that are political and not like, I love it where movies where politics is part of the texture. Like there's political characters and there's, which is like definitely the case here. And I love, I, yeah, I think this is a movie that perfectly captures work in a way that's also even sort of heightened. Ugh! if you haven't seen it, go see it. And I'm really, I'm really glad you chose this movie. I am too. I, it's one of those I always meant to see and I hadn't. And um, I know th- these these types of movies really energize me because they're ones where like, oh, this seems like this would work for the show, especially with like the premise that we have going into uh, going into each episode where there are 
you know, films don't occur in a vacuum. Like there, there's a political and social structure going on in every single film. You just got to kind of keep that at the front of your mind when you're watching. You're like, oh shit, that is all here. And I don't think, I think if I would have watched this movie like five years ago, I would have enjoyed it as like, I mean, it's a, it's a known cult film at this point. And I cannot imagine how much fucking fun this movie would be to watch in a theater with a crowd, getting into it, the soundtrack, the one-liners, the zingers, the comedy. But also, um, I think the politics are pretty on point with, with, with throughout this whole film as well. And, I, and it's one of those that you don't go back. Again, like we said, when, it, when, it first, when Lindy first shows up, in the movie, you're like, oh God, it's a '70s movie. I don't this. What's the, what's going to go on with this character? What's going to happen? And then you're like, oh, oh, awesome. Here we go. This is great. Um, wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Uh, maybe that was in my own like you know judgmental mind going into a '70s movie. Like, oh God, it's the racist '70s. What's going to happen here? Or the sexist '70s or whatever. Um, right. But no, I, I absolutely like the next time uh, you know theaters are open and it's safe and we're going to theaters. Somebody's playing car wash. I'm fucking. I'm there. Yeah, <laughs> I want to see this with the crowd so bad. Yeah, I think it's. I think, honestly, so I don't buy. I don't buy a lot of movies. It's not my geek out. Uh, but I'm probably gonna buy this. I, I, I did. I ordered it. I rented it on uh, whatever streaming service. But then I mean, I was like, ah, I need to own this. And, and then I was also a little bummed that I was like, man, I want so many special features. And I want some commentary tracks. I want some making ofs. But someday, maybe there's a there is a commentary track. I think on the latest Blu-ray. Oh, right. No, but like, I want the whole cast to get like I, my I want my dream commentary track. I want one with like, you know, Joel Schumacher and like um, Michael Schultz, like talking about writing and directing this. I want the whole cast together for one. I don't, I don't think you're going to want Bill Joel Duke to just do his own commentary track. Yeah, <laughs> I, like, I want Bill Duke. Well, just... Bill Duke is a director now, too. Right. Like I want. Yeah, I want, I want 2020. I want 2021 Bill Duke doing a commentary track on the politics of this movie. Yeah, that's exactly it. Well, considering the last considering last last week's podcast with him as a director. Yeah. I'd love to hear what he has to say about this. Um, yeah. I don't think we're going to get Joel Schumacher. Yeah. No. And there's going to be no George Carlin uh, commentary track either, but everything else. Uh, no. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. Buy it sight unseen. It's totally worth your money. And uh, you're going to, it's quite a discovery. I think Isaac, what did you pick out for? Uh... So as, as our listeners may remember, I have decided to, go with, try my best to do the most conventional labor movies I can. And in the spirit of doing that, um, I chose Salt of the Earth from 1954. My name is Esperanza Quintero. I am a miner's wife. 18 years my husband has given to that mine, living half his life with dynamite and darkness. Trouble, Quintero. You're all in one piece, so what's the beat? This new rule of yours that we work alone. We're taking it up with a super. Super's the one made the rule. He ain't gonna give you no help. They don't work alone in other mines. Well, why should I risk my life? Because I'm a Mexican? Accidents are costly to everyone. Tell them how to get back to work. They don't work for me. I work for them. <laughs> And so it began. The mine owners might have starved us out were it not for the help we got from our international endeavors. Letters came, the crumpled dollar bills of working men. The bosses have us coming and going. If you read the court injunction carefully, you will see that the only prohibits striking miners from picketing. We women are not striking miners. We will take over your picket line. We have a solution, you have none. This is a movie that I meant to watch for a really, really long time. It's about Mexican, primarily, you know, Mexican workers who focus on one family and specifically it's from the perspective of the wife. I mean, basically gender, the, the combination, the intersection, the co-constituting nature of successful class struggle and Ending gender depression is uh, really the theme of this movie. And I, I realize it sounds all academic-y and or like lefty-ish, but I am at least one of those things and probably end up being another. Mexican-American workers who work at a zinc mine, and part of what's actually interesting when you introduce the movie is these are all workers whose families were there before the border crossed over. They've been right. doubly disparate. They are, they are exploited 
by the very company that displaced them from the lands that their families probably had owned for maybe even hundreds of years. Yeah, they show a, a cemetery at one point to like point out like how deep our roots go. Right. So this is you know this is your extractive uh, frontier movie, which is actually a theme I do want to come back to someday. They go on strike um, against safety measures at the same time that their wives are pushing for other demands that include like. Better amen- uh, this is a company town, so they live, they, they're renting from, you know, there's a company store, their houses are owned by the company, you know, literally on land that their ancestors had owned. And their, their wives are pushing for other demands that have to do with housework, and the men don't actually understand that until later on in the movie, and, and new demands are added. So this is a movie that I've meant to watch for a really long time. It's also, you know, about, like... Um, like some of the mov- like the movies we did last time, it's about the racial division of labor, right? And they, it's very explicit that the the bosses treat the Mexican workers worse as a way of controlling the white workers. Right, that's the threat. That is the threat, and it's always yeah. there, and it's the privilege that they it's the privilege that they get and the threat that they have. So it's all it's all there. Can you say a little bit about the making of this movie? Oh man, do I want to document? Actually, I think there is a documentary on the making of this movie, which I need to find immediately. At a certain point, we maybe just need to do like a month long look at like blacklist uh, folks or whatever, because uh, it, it it's already been popping up in a few of the movies that we've uh, already discussed. You've got Herbert uh, Byerman, the director. You've got Paul uh, Jericho, the producer, and then also Michael Wilson, the screenwriter. We're all on the Hollywood blacklist. Specifically, Byerman, though, is the director. This is this. <laughs> Sorry, I my men, I was having a mental digression into how like it drives me nuts when people are like, oh, the liberal elites in in Hollywood or whatever. It's like, go fuck yourself. This guy was blacklisted in 1950. He was quote unquote restored in 1997. How what what are we talking about? This is not wow, that's late. This like bastion of like liberal lefty pol- like whatever. Yeah, um, 1997 is when it, anyway. Sorry, D- he during the production of his movie, um, Herbert um, Byerman. A man who's Jewish is accused by the literal the FBI of being a Nazi. Uh, right. I, it, I'm just flabbergasted throughout most of this. Um, he ended up he served prison. He was in prison for six months because he wouldn't name names during the House on American Activities Committee. I don't know if the producer and writer, I didn't look up fully their bio because I know they're also blacklisted. I don't know if they did prison time. The movie was made on a budget of about $250,000. There are credible reports that there were anti-communist assholes that were going out there with their rifles and shooting at the set. Um, the star of the movie, um, Rosara, um, she was deported because they were just fucking with this production the entire time. They had to edit this movie in secret. They got the film printed and then had to edit it in secret because they were worried about sabotage. And rightfully so, they were shot at while they were making this movie. And then for all of that work, all of that labor of love, all of the creativity put onto film, both behind the camera, both in front of the camera, it was released in America finally in 12 theaters. And what did they, what were they met with after they got a whopping 12 theaters to show this movie? The U.S. House of Representatives denounced the film as communist propaganda. The FBI investigated the financing of the film and the good old American Legion decided they needed to have a nationwide boycott. And called for a nationwide boycott by all of their members because you cannot be subjected to this communist plot. And then after all of that, the Library of Congress in 2012, Go Libraries, decided they needed to preserve this movie in the National Film Registry. So if they had listened to, if the people that were in front of the camera and and behind the camera that were making this movie, the producers, the directors, everybody, if they would have listened to the pressure they would have not made this film, which is so important at this point that it's part of the National Film Registry for the Library of Congress. Once again, sorry, not once again, I'm in the middle of teaching a class on uh, 1940s films and the whole Hayes Code idea. All of the films that we think are the classic films were said no by the industry because that features homosexual characters, that features communist characters, that features stuff that you're going to show two people sleeping in the same bed. You can't show that. Like all of the classic films that we all love as a culture are the ones that basically were saying like, no, no, you can't make that. It's going to show, it's going to show anti-racist labor activism. And it's going to show, it's going to show women taking the anti-racist labor struggle and turning it into their own and subverting it, yeah. subverting the role of men in which you, you literally reversal. I mean, one, 
just just to say that as part of this series, uh, if you're wondering why we haven't let bygones be bygones over uh, Ilya Kazan and on the waterfront, we're still fucking not going to do it on this podcast. No, no not that guy. We're not. So I mean, maybe in like a, a, a hate filled episode at some point, but I'd rather not waste my time on that. I'd rather promote something positive. But, you know, so part of it is I mean, when you consider everything that went into this movie, this is a movie with predominantly non-actors and you can tell. And I think and here's the other thing. It is communist propaganda. That's 100 percent what it is. And it works. It is. <laughs> I mean, part of it is it is exactly the numbers that you would expect, as in we are, you know, we are fighting over this. The gender, the gendered struggle, like the language they're using to describe the, the, the struggle in which the men are sort of, especially the husband of our main of our main characters on, is both a leader of the strike and unusually misogynistic. Some of those messy contradictions you really like, Isaac. I do, well, that's what's great about it. But of course, they don't end that way. It ends happily with him realizing that women and men have to struggle and there's nothing wrong with women's liberation. And maybe he does have to do, maybe he does need to appreciate the work that his wife does. And without the women, they're not going to win. So it's man, you are dead on. Like the 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 second thing I wrote in my notes here, what? Well, the first thing I wrote was like the messy gender dynamics of this household are going to are going to really delight Isaac. And then the second note I wrote was there is no way this movie ends happy. And it totally it totally ends happy because they win. I would not believe it. And I yeah. And I want them to win, and they should win. And you could say, well, you know, in real life, well, you know, real life sometimes you win because you figure things out through struggle. And you only figure it right. out through struggle. It, it, it's it's entirely possible that like one year later, if you would have just kept the cameras rolling or kept the narrative going, it wouldn't be ending happy. Right. It's very possible. I mean, so part of, you know, part of what happens is they, the men go on strike and, you know, the, the cops try to push them around and they're able to hold out and they're holding out and they're holding out. And, you know, you part of it is you see the level of solidarity of all the other minds around them. And, yeah. you know, one of the things, I mean, this resonates Actually, you know, this resonates with a movie that we talked about during the beginning of our 60s series, Burn, one of my favorite movies of all time, where basically they say if you allow this rebellion of ex-slaves in the Antilles sugar producing regions to – if you allow news out, if you allow anything to get out, it will spread everywhere. And that is actually what the mine, the mine is like. It's not about – the costs at this one mine. We could concede these things easily. We cannot allow this example. Right. We can't allow this example to succeed. But they get, they use uh, our shitty labor laws. And we have horrific labor laws right now. Go Pro Act. Uh, pressure your Congress people to pass it if you're in a place where they haven't d- uh, done it yet. And uh, there's uh, major labor, labor legislation that's currently sitting in Congress waiting for a couple conservative Democrats to let it through. I'm usually not like, oh, well, the law, but this is actually an extremely big deal and could make labor organizing a lot easier. Anyway, they – so like the men are no longer able to be on the picket line because they've got an, an injunction against uh, – I guess an injunction against picketing. So the women go out and those are some incredible scenes. Oh, yeah. The – the 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 um the, you know, the way that – but you, here's the thing is, if you've ever studied the history of social movements or revolutions, that is exactly what happens. It is straight – it's like straight out of the history books where suddenly, you know, the cops show up and try to push them around. They tear gas them. They do all these things and the women are tougher and, right. you know, drive off the cops bodily. And then when the cops arrest them, that is um, – I, I, I recently watched uh, Return of the Sohawk is 7 and they, they referenced that scene, the uh, bring us the formula scene. Oh, yeah, yeah. Funny you, you mentioned that scene because I, I wrote down there's a line of dialogue there because um Juan who plays Ramon uh the husband he's uh I think he's holding their their newborn baby at the time and uh, Esperanza uh Rosara who I mentioned earlier who was deported uh, to making this movie she's on the picket line and he runs up with the baby to one of his uh, fellow workers one of the men and he's like do something the women will get hurt and the response from one of his coworkers is like. I don't know. I think they're doing just fine. And then it's a shot of the women and they're just like fucking up the cops. <laughs> uh, I was like, there we go. That, that whole sequence was amazing because then you have like, you know, the sheriff or some, you know, white guy who's higher up in authority. He shows up. He's like, all right, fine. Arrest them all. Um, and they have some guy who, you know, rats out, uh, you know, who, who the leaders are. And they just basically end up arresting everybody anyway. And it was really fascinating to me because you go from like the, 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 the law in this case, they don't want them picketing like on the property um, because, you know, the, the owners of the mine are like, you know, hey, 
get the rest of these people, get them the fuck out of here. And so do you want them disrupting on the property or do you want them all in the jail? So once they're in the jail, it's actually kind of a funny scene because the women are completely together. They're, they're, they're chanting uh, and they're being a complete pain in the ass to the cops. And it was like, wouldn't you just rather they were outside like yelling and chanting? Just let them do their thing. Why did you just bring them all here in together in into the jail? Um, and they're just like annoying the shit out of any of the cops that have to be working at the jail then because they're loud and they're boisterous and they're, they, they, you know, they want their demands met. Well, and part of it is, so what they've ended up doing is arresting the women with their kids. There's a baby in the jail and what they did is the cops bring milk, but it's not milk that a baby can digest. This is a very little baby. So they're, they're demanding formula. They, they you know, they are, part of it is, it's the humiliation. And this is what they do to their husbands too, in a sense. It's the humiliation of the men who never paid attention to how anything worked. So this is in, in Marxist feminist theory, this is called social reproductive labor. It's the labor that reproduces life, that reproduces the labor power of workers that's needed for capitalism to go. And it's child rearing, it's healthcare work, it's, 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 it's cleaning, it's cooking, it's all of these things. And it's the sheer ignorance of men, of the men in how, how life is reproduced. Like in this case, that you literally don't know that you can't give a baby regular milk. But it, they just, you know, it's part of the reason they're humiliating them is because they're tougher and they're louder and you can't get them to shut up. But part of it is, is that these, these men don't know anything. And when the women, by stepping out and needing to take this role because the men can't do it, they also put the men in a position where they can't avoid the structures that, you know, the patriarchal structures, the contradictions in the patriarchal structures. It's really, it's really great. One of the next uh, scene or two, you've got like the guys like washing dishes, doing the laundry. There's two guys hanging up the laundry to dry and they actually start talking about like white slavery and domestic slavery. Yeah. Which is spectacular and then the 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 husband ramon um he even mentions because like his wife uh esperanza she was saying earlier about how like you know the, the the white workers they have like um you know hot water in their house yes something about you know plumbing there and then he re- it doesn't you know he doesn't realize that they need that when she says it but then later on like in this scene you know once all the women are in jail and he's now like having to take care of the house he's like god damn this should be one of our demands like we we need fucking hot water in these houses yeah We've already mentioned like this was, uh, you know, effective communist and organizing propaganda, but you've also got a, a heavy feminist streak of propaganda going in this movie, too. Yeah, well, that's just it. Oh, it's completely. Well, part of what it is, it's a movie in the parlance of our times. This would be intersectionality, but it's right. it's totally it's total propaganda that is making the point that you cannot do these things separately, that they are all combined and you can't get out of it. And that's that's part of why I love it, because. There's propaganda. So here's the thing. There's some very good leftists writing about film. And I think we're leftists who are pretty good at film, right? Yeah. But there's something we've been complaining about. We'll, we'll talk about it more with specific movies. But a lot of times uh, there's left critiques of Hollywood movies, which get really annoying because, one, they don't know how the film industry works. They don't know how these choices are. I We were talking about this. I don't want to get into specifically the movie. We'll talk about it another time. But what are their talking about a very indie director who's just been coming up and you see over and over this Hollywood movie. So you have no idea who this person is. You've never seen right. any of their other movies. But you realize that if these movies were the way this particular, these particular leftists would be, it would just be shitty propaganda. Right. And so part of it is like, in order to make an effective propaganda movie, uh, it has to be compelling and it has to hit you. And this, this is a paint by numbers propaganda movie that completely works because the characters are compelling and real even if they're not like the best professional actors or you need something like sorry to bother you, which is, you know, not exactly subtle in its politics, but it's just brilliant in its execution. Right, right, right. So what I love about this movie is that it plays everything so straight. <laughs> like it's, it is a hundred percent what it is and it's politics. There's never any questioning or wavering in it belief in its politics. And I, I appreciate that a lot. That, there's, that can easily not work very well. But in this movie, it does. Well, it's also, to me, it like took me completely out of the context of when it was made. Like This is a 1954 film, but it feels like a, a 1970s neorealist film mm. about something that happened in the 50s. Like it's, it's actually kind of astounding to me that this is actually a movie. Because like, go... 
like watch this next to any other movie from like the mid fifties. And this is so far ahead of its time because you have actual humans that have empathy and give a shit about people making it and writing it and creating it. And they're not sticking with like a uh, haze code or Hollywood dogma or like, Oh, this is going to upset like the politics. Like, no, no, just do the story you want to do. And they did. And it, it feels the way that uptight feels like outside of other like 1968 films. When we did, uh, you know, two, three episodes on that movie. Uh, this is another one of those where like, if you hit the politics, right, like you're saying, and you hit the art right as well, it gives it a timeless feeling. Yeah. Well, this is a real indie movie, right? I mean, for the time, it is as independent as it can get. And they're literally, you know, uh, under political siege. I mean, I don't know. It's it's really impressive. I It had been on my list on for so long. And I really, I don't know. I, I don't know if we're going to, I'm going to be watching a lot of mining movies over the rest of the month. But I don't know if yes. I'm, there are some other ones that are very good. And there's some ones that are very leftist. Uh, and some that may not be as much, but I don't know if there's any that's going to quite hit this level of authenticity. No, I, 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 uh, I will echo. I will second that idea, Isaac, because I was a little worried. I think right out of the gate, we hit it pretty. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm mixing all my metaphors now. I was going to say we hit it out of the park, but then I'm talking about a gate and that's not baseball. Oh, my God. I, I think we did oh a really good pick <laughs> with, with car wash and salt of the earth. Um, I don't know how well that's going to continue on my end so i'm i'm just about as worried as you are because the next movie i picked uh since i'm sticking with like service industry uh and how service industry workers are represented on film throughout the ages car wash was 76 i wanted to uh jump to the 90s for my next one because i want to uh finish up by the end of may with a contemporary one so it's kind of every other decade for me so i picked a movie i saw once when i was in high school and hated but it is all set because the way car wash is all set at the car wash. There's very little, if anything, that happens outside of that location. I'm I'm really trying to stick with movies that take place only at that, you know, service industry location. So the next one I wanted to look at was uh, all taking place at a record store. So it's all employees that are working at a record store in the 1990s. It is Empire Records from 1995. Interesting because all right, admittedly. Um Admittedly, like High Fidelity is technically 2000, but you could have chosen like a legit masterpiece movie uh, about working at a record. I guess that movie is about the owner, though. It doesn't count. Shit. You're right. Well, work the owner, so it's different. Yeah, but it's, it's I mean, still. In high you know, fidelity. Yeah, in High Fidelity. All right. So, Empire Watch. So, you, you're going to your, the heart of the 90s. Heart of the 90s. Well, also because I need my timelines to line up because, yeah. I needed it to be. I needed to be mid or earlier '90s to line up with uh, my my film for after that. So, well, what wow. have you got for next uh, next up on your mining tour of of mining films? This I month? am desperately attempting to keep this uh, chronologically even. That is not going to happen. I could easily do this just for the '40s. I could easily just do this for Paul Robeson movies from the '40s. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to start with Paul Robeson. I'm actually going to start with. I'm going to start with some John Ford. I, I, uh, my next film is 1941's How Green Was My Valley. So we're heading out of the United States for some mining action next week. Yes, we are. Well, that's the other thing is you can easily just spend all your time in the British Isles. Obviously, um, Britain and its relationship to coal is historically very important. There's this little thing called the Industrial Revolution. And of course, in the history of labor struggles, not just through the entirety of the Industrial Revolution and up through the next few hundred years, ending in a crescendo in the, um, in the 80s with the great minor strikes and uh, their defeat by Margaret Thatcher. It's, you know, yeah, I could actually just stick with UK movies, but probably that would get boring, I assume. Well, <laughs> it sounds like it might because there's also a wide variety of them out there, but we will uh, we'll see, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. So I'm a little worried going in with How Green Is My Valley and John Ford because I... My exposure to John Ford in film school gave me the reaction of, fuck this guy. I don't like this guy. I know he's a classic. He's one of the great, you know, great Hollywood uh, studio system directors. But I'm also starting to come around on some of his early work because um, I watched The Informer from 1935 when we were prepping and then recording our Uptight series because the Uptight from 1968 is a uh, adaptation of the uh, Liam O'Flaherty novel of which The Informer is uh, the earlier adaptation of that one, um, 
that's set during the Irish War of Independence. And I was like, this is a John Ford movie? Like, the politics are pretty interesting in that one. Uh, now we've got How Green Is My Valley. I'm worried I'm going to end up turning around and becoming like a fan of like early John Ford or something here. This one's good. Grapes of Wrath. I mean, there's some there's some solid early work of his maybe out there that I haven't been watching. So I think we're just going to have to live with the fact that John Ford's actually good. And yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Okay. Wow. All right. This is, you know, this is a very controversial podcast now, I guess, but that's what keeps people coming. So, you know, sit, take controversial takes and uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll get some hate mail. I don't know. A lot of John Ford fans out there. Just get up. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, probably not. What do you think about I, his uh, representation of, you know, indigenous people in his films over the years. I mean, I, yeah, but not any different than any other Western. I mean, he's, it's, he's as racist as his background, I think, as opposed to being exceptional. I don't know. Well, yeah. I mean, you could, what I mean is you could highlight but th- that, but you probably just have to highlight Westerns in general. Maybe I'll just be a fan of his like revolutionary Ireland films. I, I could, we really should do an episode on that. Plow in the Stars, The Informer, all that stuff. Like, yeah, I don't know. We'll yeah, we should, we should just do an Ireland month. So, I mean, I, I admit, I mean, this is a, this is a very conventional choice. I, my, jo- the, j- the sort of joke that I'm playing this month is that I'm choosing the most invent conventional movies about work that I can find. Right. And certainly right. this is going to be one of them, but we'll see how well that, I, I think it's interesting because these two movies contrasted every movie that we've dealt with so far has had a subtext of race. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Both of our episodes and three of them outside of gung ho <laughs> um, were very much about the, the way that race is used by bosses to control workers. Yeah. It's interesting because we're going to probably be moving out there. I mean, you know, a, a 90s slacker movie and a movie about Welsh miners by John Ford would be very good. But they're definitely not going to be about that. And we'll see if they speak to each other. Yeah, I'm going to be curious to see what happens when we smash those two together uh, on our next episode. Because yeah. um, I, I don't see how that's going to work <laughs> uh, as of right now. But are, are, are we flying too close to the sun? We'll see. We'll see. Well, you know, we got, we got a month worth of pairing. So we'll, you know. They're not all going to be. They're not all going to be awesome. It'll definitely be weird. Um, I know that, but yeah, it's a movie that was forced. Uh, Empire Records is a movie that every friend of mine, uh, even like around like the, the hardcore punks I was around, or some of the skate punks, were just like, "Oh, let's watch Empire Records." And I was like, "Oh my fucking god, we have to watch this again." <laughs> we'll just watch Days Confused instead. But it fits the bill with what I was looking for, so I was like, "All right, let's let's uh, let's try this out." Well, and luckily, I have a palate cleanser movie for after that that I'm going to do next uh, after Empire Records. So. Even as if it sucks 30 minutes in, I'm just going to be like looking forward to that next one. Well, we'll see. We will see. We're talking about movies in the future more than we're talking about movies today. So That's true. Maybe, maybe we should wrap up. We should. We should. We should. But before we sign off, be sure to uh, rate and review the show and whatever podcast app you happen to be using. And if you enjoy the show, if you enjoy our weird uh, labor mashups this month, you know, tell a friend or two or three about it. Uh, we're also up and running on the usual social media platforms there's links in the show notes if you're interested in giving us a follow we're posting a lot of uh other workers uh laborers on film recommendations this month so get some recommendations on those various platforms and uh until next time i'm aaron spears and i'm isaac miller stay safe out there as you continue fine tradition of class struggle labor deserves all that it produces Mm -hmm.